Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Sinaway. I'm an architectural specialist here at Ardex. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you for joining us for our first Learn From Home webinar of 2021. We will continue our series monthly featuring both AIA CEU programs as well as featured guest speakers. To kick things off this year, today's program will focus on sustainability and flooring. I'm proud to introduce our guests, Rami Vagal from Mohawk and Stephen Newbrow from Ardex. They will be giving us a sustainability view from the dishes and an installation materials perspective. Rami is the Senior Sustainability Manager for the Mohawk Group. Rami is a multidisciplinary professional with a strong background in sustainability and architecture. At Mohawk, she drives strategic sustainability initiatives that create positive impacts on a social, cultural, economic, and environmental level. Rami leads a wide array of projects such as corporate sustainability strategy, green building certifications, living product challenge certification, and more. Rami holds a degree in architecture from Sir JJ College of Architecture in Mumbai and a master's degree in architecture from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. She currently serves as a member on the Lead Materials Resources Technical Advisory Group. Stephen Newbrow is the Environmental Program Specialist with Ardex. Stephen has been with Ardex America since 2014 and has previously worked as a concrete and masonry inspector. A graduate in environmental studies, he specializes in material ingredient information, safety data sheets, building documentation, and other specialty product testing. He is an IICRC certified substrate and subfloor inspector, is a lead accredited professional in building design and construction, and serves on the TCMA Green Initiative and the ASTM Sustainability Committee E60 while supporting the technical department in all product categories. I'd like to thank both Rami and Steven for speaking to us today on this extremely vital topic. Please note that unfortunately today's presentation does not count for AIA credits. This is an amazing opportunity from some of the top experts in this field from both the flooring and installation material manu manufacturer point of view. We will still provide certificates, so you can expect to see those via email early next week. I will also share a presentation by next week as well. As we go through today, please feel free to enter any questions in the questions panel, and Rami and Steven will answer them at the conclusion of the session. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter today, Ms. Rami Vagal. Thank you, Alisa. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this presentation and topic uh, of sustainability. Um, in flooring. Um, from Mohawk Group standpoint, I wanted to start this presentation with a little bit of like what Mohawk Group's perspective is towards sustainability. We believe in taking a holistic approach and not looking at just one single aspect. Uh, planetary health and human health are both very much integrated in each other. And that's how we approach um, sustainability through different parts of our organization, um, through our products, as well as from our corporate social responsibility standpoint. The two main pillars as it relates to this conversation that we would be talking about today are human health and planet health. So essentially, as we go through this presentation, we will study about the environmental impact, um, especially relating to uh, flooring as well as like human health, which is not just limited to indoor air quality, but there are so many other components that contribute to overall indoor environment, indoor environment and how that overall affects um, the quality of the uh, space and how that then ties into human health. Uh, we will also be looking into some green building certification standards um, and how um, the different documentation and labels play a role um, in those. So let's begin by looking into some of the environmental impacts. So first and foremost, basic um, uh, some of the basics. So recycled content has been um, definitely at the at the basics of like environmental impact and how products um, that have recycled content have been traditionally uh, thought to be more sustainable. And while the industry has evolved uh, over a period of time and there is a lot of more information available on what truly sustainability means, um, recycled content does form the basis of also like how an overall impact of products life cycle gets impacted by the raw materials that are being used. 
Um, pre and post consumer definitely uh, are both very important pillars of like what goes into a product. Um, when it comes to manufacturing, um, we definitely ensure that our manufacturing waste, um, the pre or the post industrial waste, uh, especially with some of our LBT is put back into the product um, so that we don't put it into landfill and uh, we can like increase the efficiency of product manufacturing. When it comes to post um, consumer waste, um, uh, there are a couple of other initiatives that Mohawk does. Um, one of the most widely recognized is um, the use of like the plastic uh, bottles into turning it into our Enviro strand and Everstrand fiber that is very widely known initiative that Mohawk has been a part of. So the conversation is really like how do we use the best resources that are available that will then impact the environmental life cycle of the, the overall life cycle of the product. We also have a recycling network of about uh, 20 recycling partners across North America that we utilize to divert the, the post um, consumer product. Sometimes we're able to um, find like a reuse options um, through different like product donations or different kind of like um, like if, if a product is in a good condition, we are able to find reuse options through our partners, um, especially in non-for-profits. But for the most part, we utilize this network to divert the product from landfill. As I mentioned earlier about the life cycle impact of the product. So essentially in this past couple of years, there is a huge focus on like, what does the environmental impact of a product look like throughout its life cycle? And um, doing life cycle assessment and then um, utilizing environmental product doc declaration documents to basically study the greenhouse gas potential uh, of the product has become very much important in architects and designers as well as specifiers. Um, through all, all of the stakeholders have been utilizing this information so that they could make better product choices. Um, this is where like the recycle content piece plays a very important role as well in terms of like what kind of products you're using, that uh, what kind of raw materials are you using that will impact your product's footprint, which then helps you um, understand like what the hotspots are, where you need to reduce, how can you improve your efficiency and uh, make better product selection. So the Mohawk Group products we have in the past couple of years really expanded upon like the different kind of offerings that we have when it comes to EPs. Uh, carpet aisle is definitely um, at the forefront, but there are a couple of broad loom options as well that we have expanded our transparency information on life cycle uh, as well. And a couple of years ago, we came out with enhanced resilient tile, um, which is a vinyl free um, resilient tile, which also is um, has an APD of its own as well. Now, I want to introduce a little bit for those of you not familiar with the Living Product Challenge, um, which essentially is a very comprehensive sustainability uh, product certification, which is administered by the International Living Future Institute. And they came out with this program a couple of years ago to basically help um, look at product, transform product manufacturing from a very holistic standpoint, like focusing on the environmental impacts, such as in the areas of like carbon and water, energy and waste, but also like the material health component of it. Uh, what kind of chemicals are you putting into the products and what does that do um, to, to the product's life cycle itself, uh, as, as well as like the occupants that make these product choices. And then it also talks about like um, what about the health and safety of the workers who make these products at the same time like uh, there's different components of living product challenge that focus on equity and social side of it. So we um, through through different like taking one step at a time we started with one collection and then we expanded to about like 300 different collections in 2019 to have living product certification and that really opened our eyes to even more like comprehensive approach to product manufacturing. One of the things that it allowed us to do was like really look at our carbon and water footprints and then establish ways to actually uh, create a handprint. Essentially, the concept is that if you are 
for example, if you're using like 100 gallons of water to uh, make the product, then you you have to able to save more than 100 gallons to create a handprint. Um, this happens through like different kind of offset purchases as well as like doing some social impact like projects. And I'm only going to be able to provide an overview overview of this given the amount of content that we have to cover today but definitely like we will have our contact information later in the presentation if you're interested in learning more about like what handprints are what net positive carbon means and how how different industries are targeting that especially it's so much more important in the conversation today with climate change and other um, uh, elements uh, we all we in addition to that, we're also able to provide a certificate um, to our um, customers for what kind of impact that they are having by specifying these products, um, in in uh, especially in the net positive carbon arena. So that is a simple way for the customers to make decision and understand like what kind of impact that they are able to create. So now we're going to jump into the human health um, aspect. When it comes to soft flooring, definitely like VOC uh, emissions uh, contribute to indoor uh, air quality. But overall indoor environment is determined by so much more, um, such as like the cleanability and moisture and what the material ingredient and composition is, durability of the product, comfort and installation. All of these contribute to what the indoor environment is going to do um, and um, how that is going to in, how that is going to then inform the human health. Same with the hard flooring as well. There are stricter VOC requirements through the Resil Resilient Floor Covering Institute when it comes to the hard surface flooring, uh, as well as some of the other things that I mentioned earlier about like durability and uh, the use aspect, like during what happens during the use phase, the cleanability, um, comfort level and what kind of uh, flooring needs are, like all of those things basically contribute towards the indoor environment. And that's something that, especially in the climate that we are today uh, with the pandemic and everything like human health and how they are connected with the built environment is such an important topic. So I'm sure that everybody has been familiar with Sierra Green Label Plus and Floor Score and their emission requirements um, in the in the carpet as well as the hard surface category. And I just wanted to still touch base on that and then dig deeper into some of the other um, trends that have happened in the flooring industry in the past couple of years when it comes to like material transparency and stuff. Mm -hmm. So before we get um ahead i wanted to talk about like material transparency so material transparency and material health are essentially like based off the different kind of ingredients that are associated um that are part of our building built environment today through building products and how that impacts human health is what essentially material health talks about the potential health um, hazards that some of these chemicals that can have some of them are bioaccumulative which means they stay in your indoor environment even after the products use has um, you know if the product is not in use anymore they also have a negative environmental impact and um, that's what we try to think about from a manufacturing standpoint that there is a connection between human health and environmental health there are a lot of like chemicals of concerns and uh, chemical lists that are out there that then definitely like we have been focusing on red list a lot which red list is essentially a worst in class chemicals of list that has been developed by the International Living Future Institute, but also by understanding the different kind of chemicals of concern lists that are out there overall in globally as well. Um, and these chemicals are often found in most common like building products, but also a lot of the consumer products as well. Um, transparency is a concept where you are providing this information to your customers through different kind of documentation whether it's a declare label for um like like the material ingredient information or whether it's the environmental product declaration for the life cycle impact uh, the idea is that you are uh, as a manufacturer that you are communicating this information to your customers so they can make an informed decision 
I mentioned declare label essentially. So declare label talks about like uh, it's it's a very um, easy to read label. It's more like a nutrition label for building products. It talks about like what the product platform is and then where it's made. And then in the in the the major body of the declare label talks about the ingredient information, what that product has, and then um, lastly, but very important element of the declare label is um, like identifying whether the product is red list free or whether it is declared or red list approved so red list free is essentially the most important criteria here is to figure out whether the product has any red listed chemicals or not and not all building products today have that ability to do that because of the um, non-availability of like alternative chemistries uh, that are that are not available essentially like when you replace something you do have to ensure that the product can perform at that same standards and that is the challenge that the industry faces in terms of developing alternate chemistries there's more alternatives out there than they are today but it's still difficult in some areas so from manufacturer standpoint there's always that constant strive to make the product chemistry better um, and that's something that we have been focusing on as well uh, so the different Mohawk group platforms that are available that have declare labels um, across the board are between carpet tile and broad loom and some of the hard surface as well. And this information is available on our website um, for downloads and easy access as well. The next I want to talk about is like cleanability and durability. So essentially making a choice, um, understanding what the project requirements are and what kind of space it is, and then selecting flooring that can definitely like minimize the use of like harmful chemicals, but also minimize overall the need for like cleaning is definitely um, something that one should keep in mind because that has a role to play in the overall indoor air quality. Um, so for example, like, um, we came out with a solution of, oh, which is like our fiber, which is uh, which has an embedded stain resistant technology. And the way the fiber itself is structured, like our Duracolor Tricore, it is able to like, um, it can be clean, like 96% of the stains can be cleaned with just plain water. And that is something that really minimizes the need for cleaning, but also like minimizes the use of chemicals. So I wanted to highlight that as an example, but the the fiber itself is also red list free, so it doesn't have any harmful chemicals. It doesn't have any topical treatments on it, uh, and it is made with an average of 30% recycled content. So those are some of the things that from the manufacturing standpoint that we're able to do um, to make sure that uh, it is integrated into our products um, attributes overall. Additionally, from an LBT standpoint, I wanted to highlight that Overall, LBT has been known to be very easy to maintain and clean. Um, most of it can be cleaned with like fresh water and uh, it's durable. So that overall extends the life cycle of the product as well. If you don't have to replace the product very often, then that means that you are saving on the environmental as well as the life cycle cost. Um, so I, the one of the recommendations that we make is like identifying um, not thinking just from one channel of like material health or just carbon, just but thinking from a holistic standpoint of like what does sustainability truly mean and what kind of solutions that we need to think about based on it. And it varies based on the project to project, what the needs are of the space, what is the most optimum that one can provide. The other thing that I do want to highlight is also comfort that also um, makes an important element of the indoor environmental quality. And there's different kinds of like um, comfort levels. So comfort is very subjective. Um, it depends like some people uh, in a certain office environment, some people feel very warm, some people are always cold. And so that is subjective, but at the same time, like product making, act, making optimum product choices can help like ease some of that and provide an atmosphere where everybody feels comfortable in. 
So talking about flooring specifically, like a co different kind of flooring has different kind of like noise, noise reduction coefficient. Like if you wanna, um, if you're in a space where that uh, somebody's gonna be standing a lot, then providing cushion flooring is definitely a great alternate option to be able to do that. Um, like we have several different cushion options when it comes to like acoustics as well, like carpetile definitely has um, a lot of like noise reduction coefficient that can help towards like, um, like that can help improve the acoustical quality of the space. Um, so th th those are the different kind of choices, like especially the primary surfaces in in any space are like the walls and ceilings and flooring, um, besides the movable parts and furniture that really can determine like what kind of comfort level one can achieve um, in the indoor environment. And as a manufacturer, we're always striving to um, come up with different kind of solutions that will um, provide the most optimum experience for the user. Now, definitely, like we talked about all of the sustainability information that plays a role in how um, flooring solution, how different flooring solutions can help with that. Um, but then when it comes to green building standard, how, what's the relationship in there? How does that tie into that? So as part of this topic, I wanted to highlight specifically LEED and well building certification. Those are the two that we get a lot of like request for and as part of this presentation, I wanted to showcase some of the documentation that is frequently asked of us. So LEED has been around for a long time and everybody has been familiar with it by now. Um, it's administered by the United States Green Building Council and they have, um, the, there are like seven categories of which like today that we're going to look at is materials and resources and indoor environmental quality. Uh, that's where majority of the building products would play a huge role into. So the first one um, that we are going to look at in the materials and resources is um, the three credits that talk about building disclosure, environmental product declaration, and then responsible sourcing, and then material ingredient disclosure. So in earlier in the beginning of the presentation, we looked at like life cycle assessment and EPDs. So essentially what a project team has to do is like, um, they have to have manufacturers provide them with like environmental product declaration documentation. But it can't be like one product cannot achieve that credit. Like it say the requirement is that 20 different products have to be chosen and the 20 products cannot be from the same manufacturer. 20 products have to at least come from five different manufacturers. So one product alone cannot help you achieve that credit. So that also encourages different manufacturers to come out with environmental product declaration. And the purpose is to be able to like drive this movement of transparency uh, as well as like encourage manufacturers to really look at their life cycle impact overall. The next, the next one is responsible raw material sourcing. So um, not all of that criteria has to be met. The product, the products do have to have like either a recycle content or reuse or bio base and different kind of building products have different kind of content that uh, is available based on like what the material makeup of the product is. So I shared earlier about recycle content and why that is still relevant and plays a huge role um, in this. And we offer numerous products across the board that have different levels of recycle, both pre and post consumer um, in, in the products makeup. Um, then lastly is like the material ingredient ingredient disclosure and different kind of like documentation is requested um, such as like declare label and HPDs and I didn't touch on the HPDs earlier but we do have those as well to support the material ingredient information. Um, so this is something that LEED has like really focused on uh, in the especially in the building disclosure uh, sorry, building um, design and construction, as well as the interior design and construction uh, certification parts um, of LEED 4.1. And then under the environmental, indoor environmental quality, um, having, the, having the products that have met the CDPH um, testing requirements and providing that through either the CRI Green Label Plus or um, the floor score certification in case of hard surface is something that is still a requirement within LEED. 
um, as well. So that's the kind of documentation that is requested very often, um, almost every time on a lead project that we have to provide for. Uh, now I'll be touching base on the well building standard and the well version two, essentially. So the well program was de uh, designed by the International Well Building Institute, uh, partnering with Delos. Um, and the, the program is essentially focusing on enhancing human health through built environment. Um, and there is a huge connection between like a green building and a healthy building and how they impact each other. It's based on like 10 concepts um, and essentially the, the idea is not about, so for example, in water, they don't focus on like the water consumption, but rather they focus on the water quality. Same with air and um, some of the other concepts that are out there in the well building. The idea is like enhancing the quality of it by establishing different thresholds and protocols instead of just measuring um, the quantity of it. And when done right, like the green building and the well building standard can really uh, create a very optimum space for the environment and as well as the people. As part of this presentation, we will talk mostly about the materials uh, section and the different features that really drill down on the materials concept are uh, volatile compound re uh, restriction, the two of the emission control, and then enhance material precaution and material transparency. So let's look at the volatile organic compounds. So they have divided this into like three different parts, but they focus largely on like halogenated frame retardants and then uh, restricting the restricting the usage of that, um, as well as like semi-volatile organic compounds and phthalates especially. So. Um, Essentially, the calculation is done by cost. So based on like how many products are selected and the cost, at least 20% have to have to have these restrictions implemented in order to meet that features requirement. Um, now, when we talk about VOC, definitely like if you are meeting the CDPH requirements, if you are meeting the other certifications that we discussed earlier, you would then meet these criteria as well. The next one is like long-term emission control. And as discussed earlier, like the emission thresholds are set um, for um, both short-term and long-term uh, by establishing the same protocol that is also be reviewed in LEED, like the same kind of like VOC standards with CDPH uh, requirement, as well as the South Coast Air Quality Management District rule 113 and 1168 for different kind of products like for flooring, furniture, uh, adhesive paints, and they have the documentation on like what the acceptable threshold is for all of those and what one must be focusing on. So based on the kind of product, the threshold that is acceptable is different, but as long as like we can provide the certification that these have met the testing requirements, um, it, then that, th then we're good to go in meeting uh, these features. Now, enhanced material precaution takes it a one step ahead. So it's not just about like meeting the VOC threshold, but then how are you optimizing your material? Uh, and that's where like having a declared red list free product really plays an important role. So you have not only like identified the VOCs and not only um, like looked at what the minimum thresholds are, but then that means that you've gone above and beyond to find alternate chemistries, but also figure out like how can you can be red list free and then gone through the process of like declaring that and uh, verifying that you don't have those products present. The other way um, living product challenge that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, like living product challenge is comprehensive. And so the reason this feature is called is like enhanced material precaution is that shows that the manufacturers who do have these certifications have taken one step ahead and then go on and optimize their products to meet some of these higher and stringent criteria of uh, manufacturing. The next feature that material transparency, which was again like very common with what LEED had in there is like, how do you meet the material transparency requirement uh, when it comes to ingredients? So by having a declare label HPD or um, 
an acceptable form of USGBC credit well allows you to meet this feature as well. So there is synergy between what's happening with lead and the material category as well as like what happened in well and how they're focusing on materials as well so uh, like i shared earlier like there is a lot of like sim uh, similarities when you submit one documentation for something that can be like carried over for the other one and that makes life of like everybody who's involved like the contractors and everybody's involved in the whole process very easy if you can submit the same kind of documentation With that, I wanted to summarize what we talked about today in this section of the presentation was like looking at the environmental impact and what kind of um, flooring uh, um, documentation is available for that, uh, understanding the human health aspect and where different kind of flooring plays a role and what really contributes to human health besides just the material composition. And then we looked at like the different uh, elements of lead version four and well building standard the, and um, how different kind of like uh, documentation is requested from um, when it comes to building products. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steven and um, uh, and he's going to like cover the other part of this presentation. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Rami. Steven, I am giving you the floor here. Okay, how do we look? Perfect, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Alyssa, and thank you, Rami, for uh, for that segment of the presentation. I do want to give Mohawk a lot of credit in the green building and sustainability um, portion of this industry. They really do lead the charge in bringing sustainable aspects uh, to construction with the recycled content, their level of disclosure. It's been fantastic. And at Ardex, since we're largely involved in the block and tackle, right, the uh, how do we get that beautiful floor covering onto the floor? It's everything in between. We've sort of had to take a look at what they did and see what we can do in order to help our installers and our specifiers and our customers use those beautifully designed products with all those sustainable attributes. We've, we've tried to be involved with getting them on the floor. So sustainability to us does look a little bit different. We're going to talk about uh, what those differences are and what kind of attributes you can look for in Ardex products that can qualify your building project for lead credits, living building challenge, well building, and all of those other great programs. So again, my name is Stephen Newbro. I've been with Ardex for six plus years now. And from the technical side of things, I'm largely involved in training and product installation. And it's been remarkable how much sustainability has grown uh, since I joined the company in 2014, there are a lot of uh, buzzwords and programs and different types of information that are on the market now. So hopefully through this presentation, you'll get a look at some of those so that you can identify them a lot more easily. So we're going to look at sustainability, uh, the performance of the product, safety, VOCs, ingredient transparency, the different programs and documentation is uh, as Rami set up for us. So first and foremost, I wanted to talk about what sustainability um, means to Ardex and what our vision is as a group. Obviously, we want to um, provide high-performing systems of products. We're a family-owned business, right, in a very, very close-knit group, even on the global scale. So there's a lot of uh, conversation between us and our subsidiaries in other countries, which really, really helps through the scope of sustainability to help identify what the trends are and look for best practices. We wanna build a better future by reducing our carbon footprint, and maximizing sustainability in areas of product development, manufacturing, and of course, consumer health and safety. And that's why we're gonna to touch on those topics specifically through the rest of this presentation. So I mentioned that we were a global company. Here are all of our locations, all right? And we rely on each other heavily to get an idea for different building practices and different trends. So whenever we're taking a look at all of these different locations, we can really say that we have R&D on a global scale. In the United States specifically, we have five manufacturing locations so that we're able to deliver products 
close to the job site, not just for sustainability reasons, but for cost savings as well. And we have over 135 representatives in North America in the field, basically people who are tasked with being on site to provide support to both our installers, our specifiers, and of course customers at the end of the day to make sure that whenever we're getting these products installed, whenever we're um, doing adaptive reuse projects, and whenever we're trying to incorporate those design ideas that Mohawk laid out for you, uh, that we're gonna be able to do that properly. Training has been a huge part of our company since we came to the United States in 1978, and it continues to be. From a product standpoint, we wanna be able to source responsibly, consider the life cycle of the materials, promote repair and restoration. This is big for us. This is the name of the game as far as Ardex products are concerned, right? We wanna be able to take a space, repair it, restore it, and allow for the designs of Mohawk to be used. So those finished floor surfaces, we give you a perfect blank canvas um, that you can lay out a, a design idea. We want to eliminate waste, limit refuse, of course, and promote social responsibility inside of our company. Our new slogan this year, which I really liked, is built by you, backed by Ardex. And really, this reinforces the fact that uh, we want to be involved with that project. We want to work with you to get you the information that you need to make sure that you understand how these products perform. And we want you to know that we support our installers uh, and, and we want them to be able to use these products to the best of their capabilities. So that's why we have such a strong presence in the field. And we feel that that goes hand in hand with sustainability. And like Rami said, a holistic approach, right? Get us involved early with the, um, the design process and we can tell you which product would work best for that situation. So specifically to these products, it means that compared to similar materials or products, they have higher coverage, all right? You get more out of a single bag. They dry faster. We can turn projects over quicker and there's less in terms of emissions that come off of some of these materials. We can repair and preserve the structure, as I said before. We give extensive warranties, all right? The longest in the industry because we do have such great faith in these materials and what they can do. We handle moisture problems to protect from mold, mildew, and any kind of defects that may occur in a floor finish. We focus on training. Again, it's been a key part of our business um, since Ardex came to the United States. And we can make project specific recommendations, all right? We wanna get a good idea for what the substrate is so that we can repair it before putting your floor finish down. And that's why this photograph has a before and after picture um, the before being floor in a rough shape, not ready to receive a floor finish, but we can restore that to the after, which is the background, which is nice, flat, smooth, and ready for a floor finish. And in the background of some of these slides, you'll be able to see our materials, what they look like, how they're being used, just to get a rough idea of, uh, of what they're capable of doing in case you read through the content quicker than I can say it. So what does this mean for our customers what do all the sustainability terms that we just discussed really boil down to performance and warranty emissions and health safety of course ingredient disclosure and transparency and certification and documentation so we'll be able to address the sustainable aspects of floor installation with specifiers but installers as well right there's some great information in here that can let them know um, what they can do in order to bring aspects of sustainability to their business. So first and foremost, we look at LEED, right? That's really the biggest name in sustainability. Um, it's, it's what the benchmark is in terms of any kind of recording and documentation of attributes for green building projects. Rami touched on it. I wanted to show this to you because this is something that we see from a lot of specifiers. It's a checklist that has the different programs across the top, right? There's UL, there's um, forestry sustainability, there's declare producer responsibility. So this is a, a template of what those record keeping um, aspects of green building documentation look like. And we wanna let you know that we can work with you in order to 
get this information filled out so that you can have submittals for green building projects. Some of the programs that were referenced in the previous slide include the health product declaration, life cycle assessment, environmental product declaration. There's a difference and we'll discuss that. And of course, the South Coast Air Quality Management District and the California Department of Public Health. And we'll talk about the difference between those two programs a little bit. But of course, first and foremost, we talk about our product warranty. We wanna make sure at the end of the day that the product selected is going to perform well and that the manufacturer will back the product selected because durability goes hand in hand with sustainability. The um, college professor of mine back in the day said, what is the most sustainable structure? And it's one that's already built. It's the best way to reduce the amount of material that you have to use. So our products allow you to preserve these kinds of structures. We do have 20 plus year warranties. And whenever we talk about life cycle impact, the longer a product lasts, the less its life cycle impact happens to be. So whenever we were looking at our products, we found that a great way to, um, to be sustainable is to make sure that our products will be extremely durable and that we can back the installation of these products for years to come. So we decided to make sure that we stay on top of the industry in terms of what our warranty offerings happen to be. And like I said, for a lot of moisture control installations, products that use, or I'm sorry, a system that uses uh, multiple Ardex products, we can give extensive warranties because we have that amount of comfort in the installation. I will say one of the downfalls of these kinds of materials is recycled content, because for quality control reasons, we don't use a percentage of recycled content in any of these products. We found that uh, in order to give you a product that we can have completely predictable results in an extensive warranty, we, um, we couldn't incorporate recycled materials and have the products perform the way that we wanted them to. Now, that being said, we're doing a tremendous amount of R&D uh, here in the United States, also in Germany, in the UK and Australia. We're finding new ways to incorporate recycled content into our materials. So we're hoping over the next few years, we can release products that do use a portion of recycled content. Um, but for the time being, we wanna stay with what we're uh, comfortable doing and that's making a high performing product. So obviously it's something we're looking into. Um, regional manufacturer, we would also like to say that we have manufacturing capabilities in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Texas, Illinois, and California. And we're always looking for new ways to be able to deliver products locally. So a big component of what our R&D department does is they find ways to make sure that we can manufacture our full line of products from all of these different facilities so that materials can be delivered as close to the job site as possible. Now we'll get into emissions and health. And this is something that's obviously uh, has a huge influence on whether or not the project is capable of receiving green building credits in one of those programs that Rami spoke about, but it's also tremendously important for the installation community as well. First, I wanna talk about the difference between VOC content and VOC emissions. Both are hugely important to the green building programs. The first VOC content is a regulatory um, the regulatory program that measures the grams per liter in a product and it those grams per liter those volatile organic compounds they react to form pollutants in ground level ozone at the time of installation so whenever these products are manufactured whenever they're mixed whenever they're first placed on the floor in our case what can emit off of those products that have human health impacts the voc emissions takes that a step further it measures those, um, those volatile compounds usually 14 days or so after the installation. So now we're taking a look at what kinds of compounds could affect human health to the tenants, to the people who are moving into that space, to people who are going to be using the space once all of the repairs have been done, once the Ardex products are down, and once the floor finish is down, what could the end user be subjected to. So that's why there's two different methods of measuring 
volatile organic compounds, and we address both with our materials. So the first um, is the VOC content. That's the grams per liter. That's the volatile compounds that are in the product at the time of installation. And on the left, that table shows different limits set by the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And really, California in that South Coast uh, Air Quality Management District, that's the LA area. They have the strictest VOC limits in the country. We want to make sure that we can sell our products anywhere in the United States. So these are the limits that we follow. We make sure that each in each category, we have a product that can be used to install floor covering that is compliant with their level of VOCs. And we've actually found um, through years in R&D with our products that we have some of the lowest VOC levels in the industry for all of our adhesives. The TVOC, again, this is the amount of volatile organic compounds that remain in the product after installation. Um, this required a separate test. And starting last year, we realized how important this was to the green building industry. So we took a look at all of our products and we decided to put together a system of materials that could be used for patching and repair of an underlayment and adhesives as well that are compliant in TVOC content. And here's what that testing documentation looks like. Like I said, TVOC compliance, emissions, California Department of Public Health, uh, however you want to spin it. We have adhesives that are compliant. We follow the floor score program by SCS Global Services. And so we have compliant products for our luxury vinyl tile, luxury vinyl plank, solid vinyl tile, carpet, carpet tile, VCT, vinyl, sheets, linoleum, rubber base, and um, other kinds of wall base. So we do have a well-rounded system of TVOC compliant products so that we can join in on the fun of those green building programs and offer products that are compliant with those standards and therefore have little to no impact on human health. Here's what that floor score certification looks like. And again, you'll see in red circled is CDPH standard method version 1.2 2017. That's the newly updated version. A lot of old lead documents talk about version 1.1, which was 2010. Either way, um, this, this floor score cert certificate shows you that it's compliant with that standard and therefore has very, very low emissions. So this is what you would be looking for for a testing document for the CDPH. So safety, hand in hand with sustainability, hand in hand with human health. Our safety data sheets, and I decided that this was a very important segment because I get a lot of questions about safety data sheets. There's a global harmonization system that came out in 2015 to make sure that all of the warnings on safety data sheets were consistent across the construction industry with all products. So there's 16 sections. We have Prop 65 warnings for carcinogens if, if applicable and we have recommendations for products containing high sand and silica content. Again, since we sell our products in all 50 states, all across North America, we had to be compliant with all of these different standards to make sure that there were no restrictions on the use of our products anywhere. So take a look at these safety data sheets because there's a lot of good information here that can help with sustainability reporting and documentation, especially with LEED and other green building programs. The VOC content is usually one of the first things that they ask for, and that's in section nine. And you'll see that with two different products, we've circled the amount of TV, uh, I'm sorry, with VOCs, the volatile organic compounds on this section. Okay, so you can get this information typically straight from the manufacturer. It's online. This is something that we're required by regu regulations to, to provide. So this information's here. Of course, you can always ask a manufacturer for their safety data sheets in order to make sure that your files are, are current and consistently updated. This is a new standard for crystalline silica. Uh, OSHA, I believe in 2016, um, possibly 2017, but they, they realized that crystalline silica or sand or quartz sand is something that had a, a potential impact on human health leading to cancer, silicosis, things like that. So we realized that in order to make sure that our installers were protected, 
we had to find ways to install these materials that contain sand and this includes concrete as well so concrete has a tremendous amount of sand so do our self-leveling products we knew that we had to come up with a way to get them installed safely so what we did is we had a certified industrial hygienist join us in our technical department and we put down multiple pallets of our materials so i think at the end of the day we must have poured and installed nearly three tons of material while we had um, these these little monitors on us in order to find out how many um, or what the quantity of airborne respirable crystalline silica was that we would be breathing in and of course we had dust masks but those little monitors told us what we could be subjected to so um, as a result we did a before and after first we installed the products without any um, additional housekeeping uh, safety procedures and then we repeated the installation of those materials uh, with some certain checks and balances in place. And we're sharing those checks and balances with our installation community. So how can we work with concrete, leveling cements, mortars, anything with sand and cement in it? How can we do that safely? We have a guideline for you to follow so that you can do that and protect yourself, be compliant with OSHA regulations, and of course, you know, operate the material in a way that doesn't impact your health in the long term. And last, the safety data sheets have ingredient content in section three. Now, not all in, uh, manufacturers are required to share ingredient content if it's not considered hazardous. Ardex goes a little bit above and beyond. We give you some extra information, even though there's um, no hazards associated with some of these materials, we still want you to know that they're in the products. And this is something that you can find on the safety data sheet in section three. And here's what that looks like. Now, for more ingredient disclosure and transparency, we participate in some of the other programs that Rami mentioned earlier. The International Living Future Institute, those red list ingredients, they're now on version four. They've identified materials that are potentially hazardous to human health, including bisphenol A, phthalates, polystyrene, polyurethane, PVC urea formaldehyde uh, and VOCs among others. So I picked out a couple that were relevant to uh, the construction industry, especially with materials that we come into contact with. Um, if an alternative is not available, the material may be accepted, but it's also important to consider products that don't contain these red list ingredients. And we're willing to offer you letters that can confirm, uh, signed affidavits, for example, that confirm that materials for a certain job do not contain these red list chemicals. The health product declaration, again mentioned earlier, here's the logo. This is another method to provide transparency. We at Ardex rank in the top 10% in participation because we're constantly updating and adding to, the, um, to our product offering in terms of uh, the level of transparency that we give for all of these materials. They can be self-declared, so there is um, a, an important distinction to make. Self-declared is compliant with the reporting option one. If you get a third-party verified HPD, you can get additional credits in that category. But it's an important thing to consider that the HPD is sort of driving the industry forward and asking for more transparency than ever before. Here's a picture of what that HPD looks like. Okay, it's version 2.1 is this HPD. They're now on to version 2.2, which does look the exact same. And the ingredients of the product is right on the front. So it tells, um, it tells somebody viewing this HPD what's in the material and what kind of hazards are associated with it in a way that's much more easily digested than having to dig through the safety data sheet. So again, it's a method to deliver transparency information to the end user in an easy to read sort of way. So last, we'll look at some other certification and documentation. With the environmental product declaration, as mentioned before, it's a way to collect and assess energy, fuel, material inputs and outputs in a way that's easier to read and digest, again, than what the life cycle analysis is. All right, so we have documentation for tile, mortar, and grout in conjunction with the TCNA. Here's what this looks like again. It's life cycle analysis information, 
in an easy to read way. That's what the environmental product declaration is. Um, their claim to fame is creating a nutrition label, so to speak, of the different sustainability uh, related impacts that a product could have based on the extraction of the ingredients, the manufacture of the material, the use of the material, and ultimately the end use. Where does it go? Is it thrown into a landfill? How long does it last on site? That sort of situation. Everything's brought into account and then they can give you values. So ideally you could take multiple EPDs for a single product category, compare them and make an educated decision about what the most sustainable choice for your project would be. One of the last certifications we wanted to look at, something that we recently, uh, a project that we recently wrapped up, is getting Green Guard Gold certification. This goes hand in hand with the California Department of Public Health in terms of TVOCs and emissions information. All right, so we now have uh, Green Guard certification for uh, a family of products in a number of different systems our priming and moisture control, tile installation and grout. Um, the tile grouts themselves, substrate preparation, self-leveling underlayments, and topping materials. Okay, so we have compliant products that have emissions information. They're Green Guard Gold certified. So when you're looking at the um, the materials, uh, low emitting materials category, you can find a system of products that's compliant. You can also find compliant Mohawk products to use as the finish. And last, I wanted to touch on a couple of different um, logos that we see. Now, thankfully for the um, sustainability community, a lot of these logos are green, right? So it should make it pretty simple to identify what kinds of programs are applicable to a product because they share these kinds of um, these kinds of documents and these logos. So there's a lot of different ones. A lot of them mean different things. Definitely do your research, find out whether or not these different logos, these different sustainability programs are applicable to your products. I tried to share some examples so that you could get a head start um, to understand what a lot of these look like, but there are more that exist in the industry and not all of these programs are applicable to all of our products. And so that's why I share my um, experience and my contact information so that we could have a conversation about um, how to incorporate sustainable products on your project and whether or not the product that you're selecting has some sustainable features in addition to what they're capable of doing from a performance standpoint. And I wanted to say industry low VOC content. We're very, very proud of that in our adhesives, our moisture control systems, our primers, our sealers, and we can provide this documentation to you through technical communication team, which we have to issue letters about our products and also through product declarations that those documents are capable of delivering both ingredient information and VOC information as well. So again, we're trying to grow our portfolio of sustainable, um, sustainable attributes for our products, and we want to make it accessible to the end users. So don't simply check the box, find the correct product for an application. Performance should supersede green building characteristics, but both are definitely becoming hugely important in the construction industry. And as Rami suggested, have a holistic approach, right? Think beyond the floor, integrate multiple building systems, get your manufacturers involved as early as possible so that they can give you educated information about, about your plan. It's great to design a, a beautiful looking floor, but there's a lot of um, different aspects that could come uh, into play, right? To make sure that the, the uh, installation goes off without a hitch and is going to last for the expected life of your floor finish or your underlayment or whatever it is that you're going to be installing. So with that being said, that was all the information that I wanted to share with you. Again, I definitely appreciate everybody who, um, who joined today and was able to hear us discuss how sustainability affects our respective businesses. Rami with her floor finishing in Mohawk and myself with uh, the substrate preparation beneath that floor finish. So I guess, Alyssa, if you want to jump back on and kind of orchestrate the question and answer segment, thanks again, everybody, and we'll uh, we'll get to those comments now. 
Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Rami, for your input. Um, that was a lot of great information, and I know that I certainly learned a lot today. Um, I just wanted to grab a few questions from the crowd. Um, we'll go through these quickly, and then when we send the follow-up email next week, um, we'll address some of the other questions that we didn't get to because I know that we're over time a little bit here. Um, so, Rami, do you get more requests for HPDs or declare labels? Uh, I would say both of them, but a lot of times the request is like, do you have an HPD or a declare label? Because they essentially, when it comes to lead, satisfy or well, they, they satisfy the same criteria. So we get requests like for either or, or and we provide pretty much both of those for the products that we have. However, um, there are there are design firms who specifically request for red list free declare label. Um, and because the, um, the clients are requesting for that. So we get, when it comes to declare label, like there's always a preference for having a red list free declare label. But in terms of like the amount of uh, information that we're, we are being requested, I think it's pretty much the same in terms of like whether each PD or declare label. Great. Um, Steven, where does Artex stand on recycle content? Are we changing our views? Are we using more recycle content in our products? Where do we stand with that? Yeah, I touched on this a little bit. I, I can tell you that we do have some competitors that are starting to incorporate small amounts of recycled content. Um, the other side of that is they're also requiring some on-site evaluations to be done with the product to make sure that it's going to perform appropriately. So right now, with our system of products, we don't have a requirement for on-site evaluation. We have all the confidence in the world that the product will do what we state that it's going to do in the technical data sheets, but of course we don't incorporate the recycled materials at this time. So moving forward, we're trying to find a way to balance the use of recycled materials and therefore the, uh, the unpredictable results that we may have with the use of those materials we're trying to balance that with a way to ensure that the product is going to perform the way that we intend. So, like I said, multiple Artex locations, the R&D departments are dedicated to start um, starting to incorporate these materials, but we don't have anything at this time, unfortunately, with the exception of our, um, our sound deadening membrane. Cool. Um Rami, so just some clarification um, on the recycling of carpets. Um, you will recycle all, all carpets, not just your own on the project. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yeah, we take any manufacturer's carpet back and then work through our network of recycling pa uh, partners to be able to devote that. Great. Um, have either of you seen um, do either of you still see a lot of questions relative to the media stories around the toxic flooring scare in 2015 or 2016, and how are you managing that reporting? Uh, I don't know, Stephen, if you want to take that since Rami just yeah, sure. I, I, I know that, um, <laughs> sitting in on the TCNA, which of course that's the Tile Council of North America, and they're largely concerned with um, with hard surfaces, right? Your porcelain, ceramics, natural stones. Um, I will say that one of the ways that they uh, sort of promote hard surfaces over vinyl, um, it, it's primarily durability and they don't so much go after the, uh, the content of the floor coverings itself, the content of the vinyl floor finishes. So from my perspective, I would say that um, vinyl floor manufacturers have done a great job of either limiting or eliminating a lot of the quote unquote toxic materials that they've been using. And as Rami alluded to earlier, and I'm sure she could expand on this, there are a number of vinyl floor finishes that have emissions information, CDPH, right? Those, those uh, TVOCs that could come off the product. Um, regardless of what's in it, the floor industry, the finished flooring, Mohawk, for example, has done a great job of evaluating their products and making sure that they're able to provide materials that um, have minimal, if not zero, impact on human health. So, Rami, you could expand on that if you'd like. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, so, by eliminating the harmful orthotalates, um, that has been like one of the huge things that we were able to eliminate. 
those and um, then making sure that our flooring undergoes all of the rigorous VOC emission testing requirements and stuff. We strive to provide that um, um, to, to comply with all of the st standards that have been set in terms of like indoor air quality. So um, there's always avenues for that. That's one of the challenges that when it comes to post-consumer recycling that we um, we as an industry is also facing is like the, the potential of reintroducing the chemicals of concern back into your products. So that's something that has been challenging. But from the standpoint of what we could do eliminate, to eliminate the chemicals of concern that we can, orthothalates is a big one when it comes to the um, luxury vinyl tile. And then uh, in terms of like the soft flooring, so we, um, by by going above and beyond with red list free and then the living products uh, we have definitely like created the most optimum product in terms of like human health as well as the environmental health um, as well as eliminated some of the topicals and um, the additional uh, the antimicrobials and other concerns that were brought to attention in the past couple of years uh, around the industry Great. Um, so I believe that's all the time we have for today. Um, if you submitted a question and we did not get to it, um, we will be sending the answers of the Q&A via email with the recording of today's presentation. Again, I'd like to thank Rami and Stephen for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. I speak on behalf of Ardex when I can say that we sincerely appreciate it very much. So thank you everyone for attending today and I hope you have a great rest of the week.